evening. Good evening. And welcome those who are joining us that are watching uh, online or satellite or television. We're so glad that you're here, both in the building, in the Granite Bay uh, Church, Hilltop Church, and as well as folks who are watching online. And we've got some Bible questions that have come in, and we're looking forward to getting into those. It's one of my favorite subjects. All right, let's start with question number one. Were any of the apostles related to Jesus by blood? You know, there's no evidence in the Bible that any of the 12 apostles were related to Jesus, but evidently John the Baptist. Sometimes people confuse John the Baptist with John the Apostle. John the Baptist, it says that his mother, uh, Elizabeth, and Mary were cousins, and so there was a relationship there. Uh, Jesus was from Nazareth, and he was from Bethlehem. Most of the apostles were from the area around Galilee, and so there's no evidence in the Bible that I know of that they were related. Now, some of their, their family, Mary may have been related to uh, the wife of Cleopas, who was also named Mary. She may have been one of the Marys that went to the tomb, but uh, that's a little bit of speculation. But the brother of James was not an apostle. No, he, though he wrote a book in the Bible, the book of James is written by the older brother of Jesus. Now, some of you are probably thinking, wasn't Jesus the oldest? Write that question down and send it in. I'll look forward to answering that. All right. If the devil has a certain amount of power, do, do his fallen angels also have it, or just Satan? Yeah, I believe that you know, all of God's created beings had uh, varying elements of power, and uh, it seems like among the angels that there's some um, hierarchy. I mean, you've got the angels that are by the throne of God. You've got the seraphim. There in Isaiah 6, it talks about angels that are on the right and left of God that say, holy, holy, holy. You've got Gabriel that's mentioned. He's often sent to earth. And I think there are varying angels with varying jobs. And it's probably very interesting when we get to heaven to find out the different ranks and powers and abilities and talents. Aren't we all individuals? Mm -hmm. I mean, God doesn't make two snowflakes the same. So I think he'd make uh, angels unique and they have their own names. Uh, so I believe that some of them had varying amounts of power, but I'm sure they all had some power. So how does that apply to Earth today? I mean, can they, I think the idea is if Satan is in, has a lot of power, do his angels also have power over us? Yeah, I think that if I was the devil, I don't like to think about that very often, but if, that if I was going to assign angels, I would assign the fallen angels to the greatest threats and his more talented, powerful fallen angels. So Satan's probably got, you know, generals and captains and sergeants and privates to use, you know, kind of that illustration. But yeah, Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, Ephesians chapter six, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of darkness and heavenly places. And there's principalities and powers. I think it's a lot more complex than just good angels and bad angels. Yes, uh, that makes sense. All right. There are a lot of people who believe that the stone in Daniel 2 that smashed the statue is not Christ, but the United States. How do I show them the truth? Yeah, you know, we're going through the different minerals. You remember the presentation, second presentation was Daniel chapter 2, and you got the head of gold. You remember what that was? What kingdom? Babylon. Babylon. And then you got the arms of silver were what kingdom? Medo-Persia, Persia, two arms. And then you've got the belly and the thighs of bronze, which were Greek. Greece. The legs were... Uh, Rome. Uh, uh, the legs were iron. Iron representing Rome. Then you've got the feet that are partly iron and partly clay, because the Roman kingdom divided up and still retained some influence, but it changed. And then you've got out of nowhere, not connected, it's not part of the image, this stone that comes from heaven. And some are saying, the, you know, they're figuring, well, you're going through all these different worldly powers. The last mineral, the stone, would be another worldly power. No, it's very different. It's very different in that it comes and destroys the idol, uh, strikes it on its feet, and it becomes a great mountain and fills the whole earth. It lasts forever. America is not the final eternal empire. Mm -hmm. And so it's talking about Christ's kingdom that will overcome all of these kingdoms. The idol, <laughs> idolatry is bad. Uh, stone, the rock of ages, that's a symbol for Christ. And so, no, the stone is not America. It represents Christ's kingdom coming and Jesus destroying 
all of these other worldly empires. Because America is not going to last forever. No, I don't think we're going to last as long as Rome. No. The way we're going. <laughs> all right. Where does China fit in Bible prophecy? Hey, good question. Uh, you know, I don't know that there's a specific prophecy you're going to find in uh, Daniel and Revelation that says, you know, and then this kingdom that was really China. Uh, as I mentioned when we studied Daniel chapter 2, the principal empires that are mentioned are the ones that had like a direct influence on the spread of Christianity starting from Israel and then going to the world from there. Now there, are, you know, there are places that say many will come from the east and the west and sit down in the kingdom with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That would certainly include the Chinese people. Uh, Karen and I have been to China. And, uh, you know, we had a wonderful experience there with many lovely Christians. Uh, I understand there may be more practicing Christians now in China than the United States. Mm. Uh, and they've got so many, 1.4 billion people there. But a lot of underground churches, they're going through a certain amount of persecution right now. And but, if you know of a prophecy that specifically mentions China, then, yeah, let us know. I don't know of any right now. What does Revelation 1, 7 mean when it says that those who pierced Jesus will see him coming? Yeah, behold, he comes in the clouds and every eye shall see him and those also who pierced him. Mm -hmm. uh, and it says, well, if the, the dead in Christ rise first and the wicked don't rise until the 1,000 years are up, how can those who pierced Jesus or who were involved in the crucifixion see him coming? And, um, you know, Jesus, when he was being tried, he told Caiaphas, the high priest, hereafter you will see the Son of Man coming on the right hand of power. And they go, well, how is Caiaphas going to see the Lord come? How are those who pierced him going to see him come? And, you know, many Bible scholars believe that there's going to be sort of a special resurrection of the people that were uh, directly involved in the crucifixion and the execution of Jesus. And they're going to see him come in power, the one that they denied. And so you'll maybe have some of the, the guards and and others that were involved in crucifying him, those who tried him, they'll be brought up to see it. So it's a good catch that you spotted that verse. Why was David called a man after God's own heart? You know, it's interesting. There's a lot of people in the Bible who are named Joseph, and you've got other people in the Bible who are named, you know, Eliezer and uh, several Johns in the Bible. There's only one David in all the Bible. So it's hard to confuse who you're talking about. Uh, the Bible tells us that David was a man after God's own heart. And when um, God sent Samuel the prophet to go into Bethlehem to anoint someone to replace King Saul, to be the new king, and he got the sons of Jesse all gathered there, and they, they brought uh, the seven out of the eight sons of Jesse, and they stood before uh, Samuel. And Samuel looked at one that was tall, dark, and handsome, and he said, surely, the anointed of the Lord, the King of the Lord, this must be him. And the Lord said, do not look on his outward appearance. God does not look on the outside the way man does. God looks upon the heart. And he looked over Jesse's sons and he said, I, I don't see here the one I'm supposed to anoint. This, these are your sons? He said, oh, yeah, we got the daydreamer. He's still out with the sheep. He said, you better call him. And Jesse was brought, or David was brought. And the Lord said to Samuel, this is the one, arise and anoint him. He is the one who's going to be king. David is one of the most unique personalities in the Bible, in history. Very rarely do you find somebody that can go from raising sheep and yet they become uh, you know, a literary genius. You know, there's like 80 psalms that are written by David. A musician, a warrior, an architect, um, an administrator, I mean, David just had such an interesting personality, but the most important thing that made David unique, in spite of his power, he knew how to be merciful. When someone was cursing him, one of his soldiers said, let me go cut off his head. David said, no, let him curse, I probably need it. Not too many kings would do that back then. And when David was being hunted by King Saul, and David had a chance to execute King Saul, the Bible tells us that uh, one of David's soldiers said, let me pin him to the ground. David said, no, I cannot lift up my hand against the Lord's anointed. He said, let the Lord take care of this. I'm not going to avenge myself. David was a merciful person. And then other kings, when they would come into power, if they displaced another king, they'd wipe out all of their descendants so there'd be no competition. 
When David became king, he called in the grandson of King Saul, Mephibosheth, who thought that he was going to be executed. And David said, from now on, you're going to eat at my table, and I'll take care of you. Just, he was a merciful king, very just, uh, but he, would, he also knew how to um, exact punishment on those that were deserving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a, a lot like Christ in many ways. Although he wasn't perfect, and he had no, to repent. Yeah. I didn't want to talk about that right now, but yeah, <laughs> he, was, he had a couple of big, uh, of course, as we all do, but he, for the most part, David was an extremely godly man. He's, he had that uh, major sin with Bathsheba and, and Uriah. He did not do very well as a father managing his kids, off and off fighting wars. And then he got proud once and numbered Israel, thinking he could trust in how big the army was instead of trusting God, and a plague went through the land. Those are kind of the three big areas where you see David failed. But that gives us hope. David was human, mm -hmm. and God said he was a man after his own heart. We want to have the heart and mind of Jesus also. Amen? Amen. How can Jesus and the Holy Spirit be God and still different persons? Yeah, well, it's pretty clear. If you read the Gospel of John, we don't have time to read them all now, but you go from chapter 14 through chapter 17, Christ makes it pretty clear that he is not one and the same with the Holy Spirit in that he said, it's expedient for you that I go away, that the Holy Spirit might come. And you, we pray to the Father uh, through the Spirit in Jesus' name. And Jesus said, go baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, God said, let us make man in our image. And then it says in the same passage, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. I guess one was chapter 2 of Genesis, the other one's chapter 1. But, um, yeah, the Holy Spirit is a unique person. Jesus refers to him as he. The Bible tells us that um, uh, you could grieve the Holy Spirit. It's not, not just a force. And the Holy Spirit guided. The Holy Spirit spoke. And so when you look at the personalities of a, or an individual, the Holy Spirit possesses those things. Now, the Holy Spirit comes in varying degrees into people's lives. Matter of fact, I think some of that's in the lesson tonight, so I'll probably have to pause that thought and share it with you a little later. Okay. Please explain Matthew 16, 18, and 19. Okay. She showed this to me earlier, and so I looked it up. So this is when Jesus is talking to the disciples. You look in Matthew chapter 16. And he said to them, Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, this is verse 16 of Matthew 16, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Messiah, the one we've been waiting for. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, the word bar means son of, Simon the son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Now, first part of that, is he telling us that Peter is the rock on which the church is built? If so, uh, we're in trouble. Because Peter was probably one of the most uh, fickle and bombastic of the apostles. He often opened his mouth and inserted his foot. In fact, before this chapter is over, look at verse 23. Peter said, well, Jesus said, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to die, and I'll rise the third day. Peter takes him aside, verse 22, and began to rebuke him. Peter's rebuking Jesus and said, Far be it from you, Lord, this is not, you're not supposed to let this happen. Jesus turns to Peter and says, Get behind me, Satan. Hmm. So which is it? Is he Satan or is he the rock on which the church is built? <laughs> He's neither. Jesus, when he said, You are Peter, he used the word Petros. Petro is a rock you can pick up and throw. It rolls around in the creek or the wave, waves. And, but he says, but on this Petras, I will build my church. A Petra. And that is a rock of immense proportion. You picture half a dome, picture the prudential rock, picture the gates of Hercules. So when it says, on this rock, I will build my church, what rock? The declaration that Peter made that said, you are the Christ, the son of a living God. Christ said, on this rock, this declaration, this word. See, for Jesus... He said, the words that I speak to you, wise men builds on what? Rock. The words are compared to rock. On this foundation stone, I will build my church. 
That declaration of Peter is the rock on which the church is built. The church is not built on Peter. The church is built on Jesus Christ. The Bible says that he is the cornerstone on which the church is built. And so, um, you know, it's a common mistake some churches make when they say, oh yeah, Peter, he's the first pope. Church is built on him. It's not what Jesus was saying. Two different words are being used for rock there. Thank you. All right, in John 8, 44, it says that the devil was a murderer from the beginning. But doesn't this seem to contradict Ezekiel 28, 15, which states that he was perfect from the time of his own creation? Yeah, good, good catch. Yeah, we did say in the lesson that, um, well, it's not us, it's the Bible says in Ezekiel 28 that uh, thou was perfect in all thy ways from the day that thou was created until iniquity was found in thee. So it says that Lucifer was perfect when he was created. Lucifer was not born. He was made by God. But then it says, you are a murderer from the beginning. The devil was a murderer from the beginning. Well, Lucifer was perfect, but when Lucifer turned into the devil from the beginning of the time he became a devil, he was a murderer. Mm. And so, you know, Jesus said, not only can you commit murder by literally taking a person's life, but you can commit murder by having anger in your hearts with another without cause. Didn't Jesus say that? Whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause is guilty of murder. And so that's in the Sermon on the Mount. The devil, as soon as he began to resent that God was God and that he could not have his power, he was looking for a way to overthrow God from that point on. From when he turned to sin and selfishness, he was a murderer from that point on. But when he was first made, he was perfect. You see, there's a distinction that's made there. One talking about Lucifer, the other talking about when he became the devil. That make sense? Yes, that's okay, a good yeah. answer. I like that. <laughs> okay. All right, our last question. Is the Ark of the Covenant hidden in Ethiopia? Yeah, you know, there's, um, there's a, a lot of um, myths and ideas about what happened to the Ark of the Covenant. There's a famous movie that was made, Raiders of the Lost Ark, where they speculate mm -hmm. that the Ark was in Egypt. Uh, here you've got the holiest object in Judaism was the Ten Commandments that was placed in this golden box that was in the middle of the inner sanctum of the Holy of Holies in the holy place of the temple. And it seems to disappear from history. And everyone's going, where is it? And it seems like the Bible's silent on what happened to it. Well, one rumor is that um, King Solomon, when the Queen of Sheba came, that uh, like the movie, they had a love affair. There's not a shred of evidence in the Bible that there is anything romantic going on between Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. Uh, it's hard for people to believe that now, especially in Hollywood. But she came purely to learn about God, looking for wisdom. We don't know, she could have been 80 years old and ugly, but <laughs> it doesn't tell us. And so, but everybody's kind of created this into some romance, and then she had a baby, and the, Solomon wanted to show love for the baby and recognize her kingdom, and he gave the Ark of the Covenant, pulled it out from under the priests, and sent it to Ethiopia. Don't you think that there'd be something in the Bible about that? It's not in the Bible, it's a legend. Um, the Bible tells us in Chronicles, and I think I put a note in there. Yeah, 2 Chronicles 35, verse 1 through 6, talks about Josiah, our king, uh, yeah, King Josiah, one of the last kings before uh, they were conquered by Nebuchadnezzar. The ark is still in the temple. He specifically mentions the ark that it's to be placed back in the holy place. This is hundreds of years after Solomon died. It's still in the temple. During the time of Hezekiah, it, the ark is still in the temple. Now, what did happen to the ark? The most uh, reasonable uh, guess is that when they knew Je when Jeremiah the prophet said King Nebuchadnezzar was going to destroy the temple, that Jeremiah the prophet and the, some of the priests, they took the ark because they knew the temple would be destroyed. It was burnt with fire. All the holy articles were carried off. They took the ark and they hid it in a cave in or around Jerusalem. I've been to, Drew, we've been to Jerusalem. Uh, I've been there three times. I've gone and looked in caves. Every time they excavate in Jerusalem, it's honeycombed with caves and graves. And even Jesus was buried in a stone grave. They're all over the place. And they found one down. There's tunnels underneath the city. They found one probably. They put it in. They sealed the entrance. Then when the city was burnt and destroyed and most of the people were slain, I think the secret died to history. And it is still somewhere in the vicinity of Israel 
hidden. Because when Nebuchadnezzar curated away the other articles, they're mentioned when they bring them back and rebuild the temple. Never mentions the ark. It sort of disappeared. I think it's because they had hidden their national treasure. The ark had been conquered and captured once by the Philistines. Israel was determined to never let it be captured again by a pagan power. And that, that's uh, what I think happened. All right. I'd be really something if they found it, huh? It would be. Good evening, friends. Welcome to the Panorama of Prophecy. And this is presentation number four. Some people didn't realize they thought it was just for the weekend. This is a seminar. It is a study on prophecy. We're going through the books of Daniel and Revelation. You can't do that in one, two, or three presentations. And so when is our next meeting? Let me just check. Tomorrow night, we are meeting Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Mon uh, Tuesday, Wednesday. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Tuesday, Wednesday. As a matter of fact, we've got a couple of bonus meetings Saturday morning for those that are available. And so um, our next meeting is tomorrow night, and we've got a great study that's going to be talking about Revelation chapter 21 and 22, and that's talking about heaven. And I think you're going to find it very exciting. And then our, our meeting after that, we're going to talk about the issue that divides the world on Friday night, and um, uh, I'll be sharing my testimony and talking about the, the uh, Word of God written in stone on uh, Saturday morning. And we've got another great presentation on bricks without straw on uh, Saturday night, another presentation Sunday. So just keep coming. We're going to be going through subjects like, well, the best is yet to come. If you're going to miss anything, you should have missed the other meetings. I mean, we're going to start getting into some really good industrial strength Bible study talking about things like second, not only the second coming, the, the millennium, Armageddon. Uh, we're going to be talking about the beast, the mark of the beast, the seal of God, angels and uh, all kinds of great information. Tonight's presentation is among the most important, uh, and it's dealing with the subject of the supreme sacrifice. And when you study Bible, uh, when you study the Bible, you can see one of the great heroes in the Bible is the patriarch Abraham. And the Jews say, Abraham is our father. He's not only the father of the Jews, but Christians, Muslims, they all look to Abraham this great man of faith, and the Bible tells us that he was a man who trusted the Lord, lived by faith, wasn't perfect. It records some of his mistakes, but uh, he prevailed and became a great overcomer. Probably one of the stories in the Bible for which Abraham is the most famous, you can find when um, in Genesis chapter 22, you know, Abraham, uh, he came out of Ur of the Chaldees. God called him. He went where he didn't know just out of faith, he went out because God said, I'm going to take you to a land that I'm going to give you, and I'm going to make you a great nation. Well, he and his wife, Sarah, had no children. But over time, eventually, in their old age, God gave them the miracle son, Isaac. Isaac's name means laughter because when people found out that Abraham, who was 100 years of age, and Sarah, who was 90, had a baby, they kind of giggled. But it was a miracle. And... Uh, you know, there are several miracle births in the Bible, and all of those miracle births are telling us something about Jesus. The first patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, their wives were all barren. It's through a miracle that Abraham and Sarah had Isaac. Rebecca, when Isaac got married, she was barren. He prayed, she finally had twins, and then Jacob married Rachel. Rachel could not bear. And they prayed, ultimately, she had Joseph and then Benjamin. You can also read in the Bible about this Shunammite woman. She couldn't have a child, and Elisha prayed, and she had a baby boy. The Bible tells about Manoah and his wife, Samson. No, <laughs> Samson, um, whose father was Manoah, and his wife, she couldn't bear, and then Samson was born. You can read about um, John the Baptist, uh, Elizabeth, and uh, Zechariah. And he was born, all of these baby boys are types of Christ in the Bible, as was Isaac. So it was heartbreaking for Abraham when God spoke to him, said, take Isaac, your son, your only son who you love, bring him unto the mountains of Moriah and offer him there to me a burnt offering. Well, he knew it was the voice of God because he had spent a lot of time talking with God. He couldn't understand why God would say, I'm going to give you this child that is a miracle child, and through this child, you will become a great nation, and then say, I want you to put him on the altar to me. 
Abraham would have given up everything he had, indeed his own life, rather than his most precious treasure was his son. But what do you love more? Do you love more the gift or the one who gives you the gift? He decided he would love God and trust God more. God is the ultimate giver. He said, Lord, you've given. If you want him back, I'll do that. He didn't wake up Sarah. It probably would have been a protest. And he took Isaac and a few servants. They got a bundle of wood, and they made the trip, three-day journey to the mountains of Moriah. He left the servants, and he put the wood on Isaac's back. And as they were going up the mountain together, Isaac was probably a teenager at this time, and uh, Abraham's over 100. And Isaac's thinking, and he's gone to sacrifice with his father before, and there's some basic elements, you know. You need the wood, and you need what it takes to make the fire, and you need the sacrifice. He said, uh, Father, curiosity couldn't uh, be subdued any longer, said, I see we've got the wood, and we have what it takes to make the fire, but where is the lamb? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb. And they got to the top of the mountain. By the way, it was three and a half day journey to the top of the mountain. A day in Bible prophecy is like a year. Three and a half years is how long Jesus ministered before he died on the cross on Mount Calvary. They got to the top and Abraham broke the news to his son. He says, God's given me a pretty tough assignment. And Isaac he could have outrun his father. He could have fought free. He submitted to his father. Talk about trust in your father. You see that same trust in Jesus. He was a willing sacrifice like Christ. And just before the knife came down, God sent an angel and said, Abraham, Abraham, do the child no harm. For now I know that you would not withhold anything from me. And it's almost like God is saying, I'll be giving my son. You don't need to give yours. But I want you to know the agony that I am going through to save the human race in giving my son. You see, Jesus, like Isaac, went up the mountain with wood on his back, didn't he? Had the cross on his back. And it says, before Abraham brought down the knife, the angel stopped him, and the angel directed his attention to a ram that was in a thorn bush caught by the horns. A ram with a crown of thorns took the sacrifice. This is what you call an allegory or historical that explains the plan of salvation. That whole scenario, that whole story with Abraham is really telling us about Jesus. Tonight we're going to be talking about what the prophecies have to say about Jesus. Is Jesus the only way to be saved and the importance of eternal life? And what is salvation? Well, before we get to that, as our custom is, we're going to go out on the street and find out what do people have to say about some of these issues. Salvation to me means when someone decides to be saved, meaning they give their life to Jesus. I kind of forgot what it means. I haven't heard that word in so long. Salvation may mean uh, an absence of hell. I think to me salvation means kind of being saved and reborn a little bit by grace. I don't know because in the world that we live in, there are so many people who have never heard of Jesus. I don't want to say it's the only path, but I, I honestly truly believe that, you know, Jesus Christ is the way, you know, that's it. No, I don't think you have to, because I think there's been a lot of generations of people that have lived their lives in accordance to their light of understanding and perished before they even knew Christ existed. I feel like there's so many people who are atheists, so many people who don't believe in that kind of thing, and they're still doing perfectly fine. There's also religions, religions that don't believe in Jesus. And I think you just go with how you want to go with your life, and there's nobody else that can dictate that. The way I read Jesus' teaching is that uh, it is, salvation is open to all, um, but that's probably not what my pastor would approve of either. <laughs> Okay, now her pastor's going to know what she really thinks. <laughs> a lot of broad spectrum of different ideas out there about uh, salvation and how important is Jesus. But, you know, I think ultimately if we're going to find out what the truth is, we need to go to the Bible. Amen? So we're going to do that tonight. We're going to use our question-answer format to study these issues from the Word of God. You will see the scriptures on the screen. First question, whom did the animal that was sacrificed in Isaac's place represent? You can find the answer in John chapter 1, verse 29, 
when Jesus was at the Jordan River and John the Baptist was baptizing, he had baptized thousands of people, and God had revealed to John the Baptist, he said that you will be baptizing the Messiah, or you'll be seeing the Messiah, you'll be able to identify him. And then that day he saw Jesus on the shores, the Holy Spirit said, he's the one whose shoelaces you're not worthy to bear, according to John's own words. And he pointed to Jesus and he said in those immortal words, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The next day John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. You know, this is what we're going to do tonight, is we're going to spend some time beholding the Lamb, and it is a prophetic theme. Now, some people come to a seminar like this and say, Pastor Doug, I didn't come to talk about Jesus and salvation. I want to understand prophecy. I want to know about the beast and the Antichrist and Armageddon and 666. Let's study those things. Well, you know, this is the theme of prophecy. If you look in Revelation chapter 5, it talks about a lamb that had been slain that's in the midst of the throne. And throughout the book of Revelation, Jesus is referred to the lamb. And unless we know who that lamb is, you know, we, we're going to miss out on everything. The purpose of all Bible prophecy is redemptive. The purpose of all Bible prophecy is redemptive. God's prophecies are not just to entertain us, that he can foretell the future. The reason he has these prophecies is so that we can be saved. What good is it to you if you understand what the beast is and 666 and the Antichrist and the mark of the beast and you even know the date and the hour of Christ's coming? If you're not saved, what good does that do you? What good is it if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? Uh, you might think, well, I just, you know, I want this knowledge. Well, the devil knows more than anybody here. It's not going to save him. What you ultimately need to know is Jesus, a relationship with him. All the prophecies are pointing towards that. So we're not really being honest or fair with you if we're just teaching Bible uh, trivia and prophecy trivia, and we're not talking about the central theme of prophecy, which is Christ. Now, when you open the book of Revelation, who knows what the first line in Revelation says? The revelation of the Antichrist. The revelation of the beast. The revelation of Armageddon. Millennium. Secret rapture to witnesses. They're all in the book, but that's not what it's talking about. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And in the first chapter, Jesus appears. And he's being revealed in these prophecies. So, you can't really study Bible prophecy without looking at the very core focus, the central theme of all Bible prophecy is salvation. All right, question number two. Why was it necessary for Jesus to die? You read in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned. Everybody sinned. And the penalty for sin, you can look here in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. I, I put that slide up there. It says, for rent, one very small bedroom. Neighbors are quiet. <laughs> Penalty is pretty severe for sin. Um, see, sin is deadly and it's contagious. In fact, this planet has been pretty much quarantined from the rest of the cosmos, the universe, because we've got a deadly disease. You can just see that sin hurts. Sin hurts you. Sin hurts your neighbor. Sin hurts God. And um, sin is selfishness. And it just basically self-destructs. And the end result of sin is death. The penalty for sin is death. You might be thinking, well, then why aren't we dead yet since we've all sinned? Because through the sacrifice of Jesus, he not only bought the opportunity for people to find everlasting life, but every person has been... Um, provided with probationary time. The Lord has bought us an extension to make a different choice. He's bought us probationary time to say, I don't want to live for myself. I want to live for God. Penalty for sin is death. You can see here also in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. The word remission means there is no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. The Bible tells us the life is in the blood, and uh, all creatures need blood. Blood is what cleanses us. I remember reading uh, a few years ago, and it's also very relevant today, when they had that Ebola outbreak there in Africa. And uh, 
you know, COVID is very serious, but uh, the survival rate is a whole lot better than Ebola. And some of you remember that there was this nurse, William Pooley, he contracted Ebola, nearly died, but he survived. But because he survived in his body, he had the antibodies that were very rare because there were very few survivors. And the antibodies were basically a life serum. And he flew to other parts of the world to give transfusions to save other people. Who knows what the first miracle of Jesus was? He turned the water to wine. What's wine a symbol of in the Bible? The blood. There at the Last Supper, Jesus gave them the cup of grape juice. He said, take, drink. This is my blood that is shed for you for the remission of sin. He said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood. And he doesn't literally want us drinking blood. You all know that. Hope no vampires here. He's talking about having his life go in us. What's the last thing that Jesus did before he died on the cross? People offered him sour wine on a sponge. So there at the wedding feast, Jesus, first miracle, he provides pure grape juice. They said, you've saved the best. Then the last thing he does is he takes sour wine from man. Jesus gave the human race a blood transfusion. Basically, he took our badness and he gives us his goodness. He made this great exchange with us. You can read also in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3, Christ died for the sins of the Jews died for the sin of the whole world. Did he only die for the sins of those who choose to believe in him, or did he die for everybody? Yeah, I said, whosoever will. God is not willing that any should perish, but he wants all to come to repentance. And God, who would have all men to be saved? That means there's not a human being on this planet that Jesus doesn't love. And, you know, there's no words that I can find that would help you to adequately understand how much God loves you. I pray all the time, for me, I say, Lord, help me to get a better concept of how much you love me. It's not because I want to have warm feelings. It's just as I know how much God loves me, I know the better I love him, the better I want to serve him. The more I love him, the more I want to tell other people about him. I reason that I think that you've got a church that is pretty much enfeebled in these last days is because people really don't understand the love of God. Christ died for our sins because he loved us. He took our place. Now, sin is deadly. It killed him. It's sort of something like, if you can imagine, if you will, uh, a family that lives on a beautiful island out in the Pacific where it's, it's tropical paradise, and they got an abundance of good food and fruits and clean water. Family with 10 children. You know, it's like Robinson Crusoe with 10 children. They're all having a wonderful time. Uh, and the one of them, for some inexplicable reason, um, contracts a deadly, painful, fatal disease. And the parents have to make a diff difficult decision because it's extremely contagious. They know if that child stays on the island, it'll infect all the other children. And they love that child. Wouldn't they be doing everything they could to find a way to isolate that child and heal them if they could? Put them on a raft, find some cure. This is what God is faced with. He had to pretty much separate us from the rest of the universe because sin is deadly and it's contagious. And Jesus said, there's only one way. I will take their penalty to meet the demands of justice. I will take their weakness and their sin, and I will give them my strength. I will give them my purity. I will give them my power. They will be new creatures. You also read in 1 Peter 3, verse 18, for Christ also suffered once the just for the unjust. He is just. He never sinned. He did not deserve it, but he died for you and me. And you know what's amazing is God knows me, and if you knew me like I know me, you, I don't know if you like me now, you wouldn't like me then. And same thing probably me of you. God knows who I really am. God knows all of our sins. He knows everything we've ever done wrong, and yet he will still die for us in spite of that. He loves us that much. I was amazed years ago. They had this criminal, Jeffrey Dahmer, who murdered people, and I think ate them, cannibal. And when he went to court, his father went to court and said, we still love our son. You think, how can they show their face? But, you know, you just cannot understand sometimes the love of a parent. Well, God loves his children infinitely more than any earthly parent 
loves their children. He loves you. Now, I'm saying this, I'm being very graphic, because I meet people all the time and think, well, I know God loves most people, but I've been really sinful. You know, that's what qualifies you. Jesus came to seek and to save sinners. And you are not a better sinner than God is a Savior. Amen. So whatever your sins might be, the Lord wants to save you. So what is this great plan of salvation called? It says in Revelation 14, 6, I told you this is a prophecy subject. Having the everlasting gospel. This is our study tonight. What is the everlasting gospel? The word gospel means good news. Having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. You read in Revelation chapter 14, where this passage comes from, that in the last days, just before Christ comes, in chapter 14, Jesus is pictured coming in the clouds to harvest the earth. And just before he comes, there's pictured these angels flying in heaven with these messages. And they're giving them with a loud voice. And one of those messages is this angel's got the everlasting gospel to preach unto those that dwell upon the earth. Do you know, this is being fulfilled tonight. God is giving this message around the world, and I'm just one of thousands of preachers that are doing it, but we're sharing the gospel truth. People are being called. And you know what's really exciting? Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, Jesus said, the gospel of this kingdom will be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations then the end will come. Well, it is happening now. This is the generation when the gospel through radio and television and satellite and the internet is going into all the world and governments can scarcely do anything to stop it now. The gospel is going into all the world. Before the program, Karen and I look at the list of countries that are writing in. There are some countries where people say, we are watching these programs. If our government found out, we could be thrown in jail or killed. But the message is going out. And what did Jesus say? The gospel will go into all the world as a witness. And then the end might come, could come, may come. He said, it shall come. It will come. It's definite. So that's why I think we're living in that generation. You may be among the ones who will live and see Christ come, and you won't have to experience death. Isn't that good news? But you need to be ready. We need to have that transformation experience that Jesus is offering through the power of the gospel. Why did God make such a fantastic sacrifice for us? For God so, what? How many of you know this verse in John 3, 16? For God so loved, say it with me, would you? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him may not perish but have everlasting life. You know, that is such a wonderful verse. I took off tonight before I, I came. I usually print out a couple notes, and I forgot. But I think I was able to print this one thing on my phone I want to share with you real quick. Just about John 3, 16. It, it's one of the greatest verses. Listen to this. Just break it down for a second. This is John 3, 16. For God, the greatest giver, so loved, the greatest motive, the world, the greatest number that he gave, the greatest act, his only son, the greatest gift, that whosoever, the greatest invitation, believes in him, the greatest opportunity, should not perish, the greatest deliverance, but have eternal life, the greatest joy. This verse is so jam-packed, volcanic, explosive with promise. That's why it's many people's favorite verse. He so loved us. I remember reading years ago about a... Um, a pastor that um, he was reading the newspaper one morning and he saw in the obituaries a tragic story a family in his neighborhood they bought their four-year-old boy their only child one of those old radio flyer red wagons for his birthday and the first day he was out in the driveway playing with it and they had a sloping driveway and he had not learned to negotiate it yet and he went careening out into the street and was killed by a truck. And the pastor saw that, and he started to cry. And his wife walked in and said, what's the matter, dear? He said, I just read this story. It's just so heartbreaking. On his birthday, four years old, their only child, and then the phone rings in the pastor's house. It was someone from the family. And they said, we're looking for a minister to conduct the service. And he said, of course, I'll be happy to help. And I'll tell you, one of the toughest things for pastors is when you do a funeral, and you got that little white casket. And it's hard to describe. And uh, 
after the funeral, it's traditional. Minister stands at the head of the casket. There's usually flowers around. The family files out. They give the regards. The last one out is the family. And when the mother came by, she took a hold of the casket and would not let go and began to wail and say, we loved you so. We loved you so. And the pastor said, I can never read John 3.16 again without thinking about the power of that two-letter word, so. God so loved the world. Put your name in there instead of world. God so loved Doug that he gave his only begotten son that if I believe in him, I might not perish. That's for you. He loves every person that much. He made you in his image. He made you to live forever. And yet the devil has got the world so distracted with things that will never satisfy, they miss out on eternal life. What must I do to benefit from Jesus' sacrificial sacrifice? The Bible tells us some things that uh, happen. First of all, you've got to believe. That almost sounds too good to be true. All things are possible to those that believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And it starts with simple faith. Now, I mean, once you do believe, you're going to see changes, but it starts with belief. If is a two-letter word, but it's a very dangerous word for Jesus. When Jesus died, he was executed between two thieves. Both thieves were asking for deliverance. One of them said, if you are the Christ, save yourself and save us. He figured that Jesus would put himself first. The other thief said, Lord, remember me when you come into your paradise. No doubt, he says, you are the Lord, and I believe you've got a kingdom. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, verily I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. He said, verily I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. What a wonderful promise. Now, did that thief do a lot of good works and make donations and philanthropic work and, and uh, you know, did he cook at the church every week? Did he do any good deeds that earned his salvation? Or did he simply reach out, pray, and believe? The Bible is going to give you a few steps of what you need to do to be saved. We all need to know what that is. One of them, believe. Believe that Jesus loves you. Believe that Jesus will save you. Would Jesus go through all the trouble that he went through to leave heaven and come to this world, it's a dark world compared to heaven, where there's evil, to be hounded by the devil for 33 and a half years, to be tortured on a cross? Would he go through all of that to save you if you could not be saved? Of course you can be saved. Believe it. Once you believe it, you give God permission to start making changes in your life, but it starts with faith. All things are possible to him that believes. Without faith, it is impossible to please God, for he that comes to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So believe. You know the story where it says in John chapter 3, verse 14 and 15? By the way, we all know John 3, 16. Here's the verse just before John 3, 16. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, I don't know if you know what the story is or remember the story, but when the children of Israel were going through the wilderness, they ate manna for several years. They kind of got tired of manna. They were eating, you know, manna cereal in the morning and manna sandwiches for lunch and manna loaf at night and... They started saying, man, a man, a man, you know. They actually had other things to eat because they had sheep and goats. And, and they started complaining and murmuring. And God withdrew his protection. And it says a plague of serpents broke out, venomous, deadly serpents. And they were all being bit. Every morning they'd get up and they'd put on their moccasins and there'd be a snake in their boot. And they're all getting bit and they were dying. And uh, God told Moses, as the people came to Moses, said, we've sinned, forgive us, pray to God for us. God said, Moses, I want you to make a bronze serpent, put it up on a pole, on a staff, lift it up. Whoever looks at that serpent on the pole will be healed. And a lot of people have wondered, why would looking at a snake up on a stick, isn't a snake a symbol of the devil? Yeah. But what does a snake on a stick mean? Now, friends, I, I've got an insight into that that I think will really help. I used to live up in the mountains in a cave. I lived in the desert. We had rattlesnakes everywhere. And I had a snake stick. Shepherds are familiar with this. 
When you kill a snake, you don't reach over and pick it up because a lot of times you think they're mortally wounded until you grab them. They're extremely tenacious and they will spin around and bite you. When you're gonna move a venomous serpent that you've clobbered, you do not pick it up with your hand. When the Hebrews, shepherds, they all had staffs. They were going through the wilderness. They'd see a venomous serpent and they'd clobber it. I did it with a broomstick not too long ago up in the hills. Picked it up with this broomstick, took it out, flung it somewhere safe where nobody would step on it again. A snake on a stick is a symbol of a defeated serpent. Jesus dying on the cross is a symbol of a defeated serpent. In the blood of Christ is the anti-venom for sin by his death. And when we look to Christ on the cross, we realize he lived a sinless life. And he has bought the right to forgive us because he took everything I deserve and he's offering me everything he deserves. And that should so move our hearts that we want to serve him. Amen. As many as received him, so you pray, you confess your sins, you look in faith, you are transformed by beholding. Do you know that? You become like whatever you look at. That's why the Bible tells us that um, we've got to be careful what we look at. Christ said, if I am lifted up, meaning a position of visibility, I will draw all men unto myself. And again, John 1, 12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. When you turn to Jesus and you ask him to forgive you for your sins, he adopts you as his own child. So how then am I forgiven and cleansed? How does God cleanse us? What's this process, uh, the science of how this works? First of all, Acts chapter 3, verse 19. You can also read this in Acts chapter 2. The first word is, what's it say up there on the screen? Yeah. Repent. Therefore, be converted that your sins might be blotted out. When you look to Jesus in faith and you accept him, then tell him you're sorry for your sins. And this is the second part of that. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from a little bit of unrighteousness. I didn't know if you're reading that with me, but oh yeah, it does. It says all unrighteousness. You mean after my life of sin, I can tell the Lord I'm sorry for my sins and repent of my sins and confess. And he says he will cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Amen. That's right. In the Bible, you've got adulterers, adulteresses, murderers, thieves that are forgiven by God. Paul said, and such were some of you, but you've been cleansed, you've been forgiven, you've been washed because of Jesus. He completely transforms you. Uh, again, I'll be sharing my testimony this week, and I hope you can come for that presentation. But uh, I was a thief. And uh, just you name it, I was in and out of jail, God completely changed me by the power of the gospel. That's why my greatest joy is telling people this good news. But it says you need to repent. Now, repentance means a genuine sorrow for sin where you're willing to turn away from it. There's a lot of Christians that sort of teach a shallow idea of repentance. Um, they'll have a church service, and they'll say, if you'd like to accept Jesus and have eternal life, you know, raise your hand, say this prayer. Yes, Jesus, I accept you and go home and they kind of pretty much continue living their life. Repentance is where you have a sorrow for your sin and you genuinely want to be made different. You want to be delivered from your sin. A lot of people have different addictions. You don't want to just be forgiven and continue with your addiction. You want to be saved from your sin, right? What does the Bible say to Mary? Jesus said, or the angel said to Mary, you'll call his name Jesus because he will save people from their sin. He wants to transform you and save you from your sin. Sin is your problem. So we repent. Now, if after the program I try to, you know, I take off my microphone, I go back and I, I try to greet the people that are coming. And if on my way to the back door, uh, I run into you and I knock you down and throw you to the floor and your stuff scattered everywhere and I say, excuse me, and I keep going, well, that's probably not right. I ought to stop and, you know, help you up and apologize, be a little more thorough. If on the way to the door, I bump your elbow with my elbow, I just say, excuse me, I go on my way. The degree of offense dictates how much you apologize. See what I'm saying? So when we say, thank you for salvation, Jesus, and we just walk away, we don't have a concept of what he suffered for our sin. We don't have a concept of what the father suffered and so loving that he gave his son. I'm just being frank with you, friends. I think that a lot of Christians have a very superficial, shallow understanding of what it means 
to be converted. Here's what I recommend. The Bible says part of being a Christian is repenting and confessing your sins. How many of you can remember every sin you've ever committed? You don't have to show your hands. I don't think any of us can. So what you might try is go home, get by yourself. Use the Ten Commandments as a template. You'll find them in Exodus chapter 20. Say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Sin is transgression of the law. I've been dishonest. Forgive me for my lying. That covers a whole category right there, doesn't it? Say, Lord, I'm a murderer. And you think, well, Pastor Doug, I'm not a murderer. If you're angry with your brother without cause, I've thought impure thoughts. The Bible says adultery is not just the act, it's the attitude, right? Most of us have broke all Ten Commandments in our hearts. Confess your sins to him, and you know, he'll give you specific things. Say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Forgive my sins. You think, well, Lord, is there something that I'm not thinking of? Pray that prayer of David, Lord, search me, try me, see if there be any wicked way in me, lead me in the way everlasting. God will show you things. Oh, yeah, I stole $20 from my sister 20 years ago. I never have mentioned that again. Maybe I should ask forgiveness and give them $20 with interest. <laughs> oh, yeah, I borrowed my neighbor's rake two years ago. I still have it. Lord, please forgive me. Well, don't just ask for forgiveness. Take the rake back, right? So this is what it means to be a Christian. As far as possible, confess your sins, repent of your sins, and you might need to right some wrongs. You might need to write some letters. Say, Lord, there's people that I've just been really mean to, and, and I want to ask them to forgive me because now I'm a Christian. I know people that uh, they said, Pastor Doug, I want to accept the Lord. I want my sins forgiven. I've got a little issue. I stole some money from my employer. What do I do? He'll fire me if I tell him. I said, well, what profit is it if you gain the world and you lose your soul? If you gain a job? I said, be honest and pray about it. And virtually every time somebody has gone in by faith and said to their employer, you know, I need to be honest with you. Uh, I stole some money from you or I took some product and uh, I've become a Christian and it's bothering my conscience. I want to return that. Or maybe they can't even return it. They confess it. And most employers will say, wow, Eureka, I've got an honest employee. I think I'm going to keep him. And they forgive. But part of being a Christian is not just repentance, it's what you call restoration. It teaches that in the Bible too, but you don't hear too many sermons about that. It's being a new creature, righting wrongs. And you know what? You do that. If you can put that list on the bed and kneel by it and say, Lord, you promised to cleanse me from all unrighteousness, thank you for cleansing me. And believe, and throw that list away. Don't anyone press the delete button. Don't let anyone get that list. And you're going to feel such relief and peace in your life when you do that. What is this wonderful conversion experience called? You can read about it there in John 3, verse 7. You must be, what did Jesus say to Nicodemus? You must be born again. What's he talking about when he said you must be born again? It's talking about you become a new person. You get a new beginning. And when you come to Jesus, you get a new start where all of the sins and the mistakes of the past are washed away like an innocent baby. You come forth into a new world and you are adopted into the family of God. God now calls you his son, his daughter, and he will watch over you. It's like, for me, one of the greatest miracles is metamorphosis. How you see this worm turn into this elegant winged creature. What a transformation. That's what happens in conversion. You become a new creature. He changes you. Old things are passed away. All things become new. And you get the innocence of a little baby. Who enters the heart of a Christian, of each born-again Christian? The Bible says, the spirit of truth. But you know him, for he dwells with you, and he will be in you. Notice again the emphasis on he. The Holy Spirit will be in you. And every day, I pray for the Holy Spirit. All the time, many times through the day before the program, I'm saying, God, I want your spirit to be in me. Because uh, he will lead you, he'll guide you, he'll give you wisdom, he'll give you sensitivity about what to say, how to treat people, how to be like Jesus. The Bible calls it being spirit-led. And in the same way, I believe in the last days, God wants to baptize his people in the Holy Spirit. And I think you're going to see the same kind of outpouring of the Spirit and the miracles that you see in the book of Acts. I think that's going to happen again before the second coming, don't you? Well, how's that going to happen? You know how the disciples received the Holy Spirit in uh, Pentecostal power? 
is they spent 10 days together praying, confessing their faults, forgiving each other. And when their hearts were emptied, then God could fill them. God wants to fill you with his love, his joy, his abundance, but unfortunately, our hearts are so full of the world, there's no room for anything else. When you humble yourself before God, he will fill you with the Spirit and he will lift you up. He wants to lead you and guide you. You know, the Bible tells us that if you, are, if you have a child and they say they're hungry, if your son is hungry, would you give him a stone instead of a loaf of bread? Would you give him a serpent instead of a, a fish? Would you give him a scorpion instead of an egg? And then in Luke it says, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those that ask him? You don't ask him once. You don't only eat once, do you? You eat on a regular basis. We need to be asking him for the Holy Spirit every day. It's like the uh, husband that tells his wife, she says, you never say that you love me anymore. He says, I told you when I married you, if I change my mind, I'll let you know. <laughs> they want to hear it more often, don't they? So we need to continue to pray for the, the Holy Spirit to be in our eyes. The Spirit of truth will be in us. Question nine, when Jesus lives in my heart through the Holy Spirit, what will I do? How are things different? Both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Uh, and that's Philippians 2.13. We are going to be daily wanting to seek out what God wants us to do. We're going to be sensitive to God's leading. You're going to start seeing the most amazing miracles happen in your life. When I was a baby Christian, uh, I think I needed a little extra encouragement because um, uh, I, I was very cynical. Uh, like John, I'm from New York City, and they got so many schemes there and con artists that when I started reading the Bible, I just I didn't want to be taken in. So when I was praying, um, I believed, but the Lord had to just give me some, uh, some encouragement. And I saw so many miracles happen that proved to me that God is real. And he'll do this for you. So pray for his leading and his will to show you what to do, and he will. You know, we sing that theme song each night, help me to know your will, Lord. The greatest battle is not just knowing God's will, is to have a willingness to do his will. Number 10, why should I be confident that my new birth experience will be successful? Answer, he who has begun a good work in you will complete it into the day of Jesus Christ. This is Philippians 1, verse 6. You know, there's so many people that think that, um, you know, I started out, but I'm not seeing much progress. I want God to finish what he started in my life. The Bible promises God is the author and the finisher of your faith. He will finish what he starts in your life if you ask him. He who begun a good work in you will perform it. Jesus is not a quitter. Some people get discouraged. They say, you know, I came to Jesus, but I had no idea that there was going to be problems afterward. I think pastors do a disservice to people when we make it sound like you come to the altar and you accept Jesus, and it's going to be a bed of roses and a bowl of cherries from there on. When the children of Israel escaped the slavery of Egypt, did all of their problems end? They crossed the Red Sea. You can call that baptism. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, that's like baptism. They're no longer in the territory of Egypt. They're beginning their journey to the promised land, and they rejoiced for a little while, but then they were attacked by the Amalekites. God gave them victory. They went and fought with Joshua, and Joshua led them to victory. They ran out of bread. They got hungry. They murmured and complained, and God gave them bread from heaven. They ran out of water. They got thirsty. God gave them water. They just had challenge after challenge to test their faith along the way, and they're wondering, why don't we just go directly from Egypt to the Promised Land? They did a lot of wandering. You know why? They had to go through what you call sanctification. They went through a process of learning to trust God. Now, it says in Isaiah, learn to do good. Once you come to the Lord, you have to sort of unlearn everything you learned in the school of the devil, and you've got to learn now what it means to follow the Lord. Do not be discouraged if you fall down a few times in your early walk with Christ. When parents have a baby, they don't expect that baby to pop out and start running a marathon, right? They know that baby's not even going to be able to roll over at first. And it's got to learn to crawl, and it has trouble doing that. They start out doing this little combat crawl like a, a worm on the ground with their elbows, a shimmy, and then we're so excited when they can roll over. Well, you know, if they're 12 years old and all they can do is roll over, we got a problem, right? 
So you want to see progress along the way. And then they walk and they crawl and they stumble and they fall. But you don't get too worried because you see they're growing. This is what it's like for a Christian. You're born again, but you've got to learn. He will finish what he started in your life. Don't get discouraged. But you need to examine yourself. 2 Corinthians 13, is there growth? Are you growing closer to the Lord? Why do some people fail in their Christian experience? We're being very honest, and, and I hope if you've got questions on this subject, you'll send them in. We'll do our best to answer them. We have turned everyone to his own way. Even after you accept Christ, you've got that old selfish nature that's in there battling for supremacy. You've got two sides that are sort of at war. And the one that you feed is the one that wins. You've got a spiritual nature. You've got a carnal nature. And Paul describes that battle in Romans chapter 7 and Romans chapter 8 between the two sides. And um, it's selfishness at war with love. And this happens in our hearts. Isaiah 53, to, uh, verse 6, we've turned to our own way. The biggest battle that Jesus ever faced was in the Garden of Gethsemane when he prayed to the point of he's perspiring blood, and he says, Lord, not my will, thy will be done. And each of us kind of has that struggle every day. We've got this battle between the will of God and our will. That's why we say, Lord, help us be willing to do your will. Not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom, but he that does the will of my Father in heaven. Christians are not just saying, Lord, Lord, we are willing to do his will. Can you say amen? amen? Be mindful of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Be considering what God has commanded us to do and be willing to do his will and follow those commands. Number 12, how can I know that Jesus accepts me and that I'm his child? You know, God wants us to have assurance. He doesn't want us to be presumptuous, but believe his promises. Titus 1, verse 2, God who cannot lie has promised. God never breaks his word. He's promised that if we come to him and we confess our sins and repent of our sins, he forgives us, he accepts us as his child, and uh, God does not disown you the first day you make a mistake. He is a loving child, and he's patient with us. Also, it says, ask, and it will be given to you. Again, going back to that praying for the Holy Spirit, be in an attitude of communing with him. So the three of the most important things you can do as a Christian is one, you come to Christ, you accept him. Then after you've accepted Christ, what does a baby do to grow? It eats, it breathes, gets an occasional cleansing, it rests, and as a baby Christian, we need to feed on the Word of God, breathe in prayer. You get the regular cleansings. You'll need to occasionally be repenting of your sins and asking God to forgive and to cleanse you. And if you do those things, you'll grow. Have you ever seen a baby worried about growing? You talk to this toddler and they look all troubled. You say, what's the problem? They say, I'm afraid I'm just not going to grow. They don't worry about that. They freely receive what their parents provide and the natural response is that they grow. If we are reading the Word, even if you don't understand everything, read the Bible. Because the more you read it, it's like a new language. You're going to start understanding it. I remember hearing a story in China about this man. His name was Gu, Mr. Gu. And he was in prison in China, and he was not a Christian. But uh, another Christian had left a Bible in his cell hoping that he'd read it. It was just a New Testament. And Mr. Gu was not at all interested in Christianity. But um, he was interested in cigarettes. And he had tobacco, but he did not have rolling paper. It's a true story. I, I, it scares me to tell you this, but... So he thought, well, I can use the pages of the Bible to roll my cigarettes. But before he did it, he thought, well, my friend told me that this is a holy book, so maybe I should read it before I smoke it. <laughs> so he looked at the first page in Matthew, and he thought, I don't even understand all these names. He tore it out, and he smoked Matthew chapter 1. And he kept reading as he kept smoking. And Mr. Goo smoked his way through Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And then when he read John 3, 16, he gave up smoking and accepted Jesus. He realized he didn't understand it at first, but as he kept reading, he understood it, and it changed his life. 
and he surrendered his life to the Lord. Number 13, how will true conversion change a person's life? So when you have come to the Lord and you've experienced genuine conversion, what happens? A says, by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. You know, some people say, oh, you know, I don't want to go to church. There's some hypocrites in church. Well, that's the best environment to learn love in. The disciples, did they argue among themselves? The Bible says they did. Do families sometimes argue? Do we need people? Now, this is, this is very, a very real subject or topic to me because I had lots of problems growing up getting along with people, and it got so bad, I finally said, I am going to get away from everybody, and I lived in a cave for a year and a half. I wanted to just be a hermit. You can ask Mrs. Bachelor. I can go up to the hills all by myself for quite a while and be very content. And, but God told me, Doug, I did not call you to go live off like a hermit. You've got to learn to love. And uh, that means you need to be around people. And sometimes people aren't lovable. I know I'm not lovable. And the way you learn love, if you say, Lord, give me patience, you know what he's going to give you? Delay. If you say, Lord, give me love, do you think he's just going to give you some pink package in the mail? And it's going to love, it's going to spill all over you with a little sparkle fairy dust. And you can love everybody. No. He's going to put unlovable people around you. And you're going to learn how to love. That. Once you learn those people, the lovable people are really easy. Right? But he's going to teach you to love. And how did the Bible say that everybody is going to know we're his disciples? By our love for one another. By our love for one another. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. People should see a transformation in your life. My old family and the kids that I used to go to school with, they see... Doug Batchelor now, and they said, Doug became a preacher, a pastor, and I was Jewish, a Christian. <laughs> I re reconnected with some of my friends on Facebook, and they just, they see a change. And I say, God, oh, what God did for me, he'll do for you. I was miserable then, I'm happy now. You become a new creature, a new creation. Amen. Answer C, we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. We, you know, God's law is not that complicated. People like to argue about, you know, what the law of God is and what God wants. It's like Mark Twain said, it's not the mysteries in the Bible that cause me sleepless nights. It's the good I know I should do. And most of us understand what God wants us to do. Be willing to obey God. Sometimes we're afraid of the consequences of obeying God. Trust him. You're going to think, oh, how am I going to get through this? God is in the business of working miracles when you trust him. Keep in mind, God will never, ever ask you to do something without giving you the power to do it. In every command of God is inherent the power to obey what he is commanding. Answer D. And do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You are transformed. You, your mind is changed. You're learning new things. And then the Bible says, you will be witnesses to me. You know, you're not going to be able to keep the good news to yourself. Your face is going to advertise. People are going to see that you learned something. How many of you ladies out there have friends and you can tell that they're in love because their expression changes? I remember my grandmother one time, she said, oh, she's in love. So how do you know? So you can just look at her. You can tell. And when people fall in love with Jesus, you can't keep it to yourself. You want to talk about the one you love. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit will be praying to the Lord, communing with him, walking and talking with the Lord. The Bible says Enoch walked with God. That means he was in an attitude of prayer and communing with God all the time. I'm praying as I'm preaching to you. I talk to the Lord all the time. Number 14, what wonderful promises come with a Christian life? The Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He's going to give you strength to do whatever you need. God promises to supply all your needs. He says, you know, he feeds the birds and he clothes the flowers. God will take care of you. You can trust him. Amen? Answer C, with God, all things are possible. You've got to believe that with God's help, you can do everything. Answer D, that your joy may be full. Jesus said he's come to give us 
an abundant life. And that's our next answer, John 10.10, 10, that they might have life more abundantly. People think, oh, to be a Christian, I've got to give up this, I've got to give up that, and I can't have any fun. Nothing could be further from the truth. I have so much more fun now as a Christian, and there's no hangover than before. It's much better to be a Christian. It's an abundant life. Answer F, you're never alone. He says, I will never leave you or forsake you. Not only that, because you're never alone and God is with you, you have nothing to fear. Hebrews 13, verse 6, I will not fear what man can do to me. And answer H, he says, my peace I give unto you. God wants to give you that peace, friends. And you know, tonight, I want to give you an opportunity to respond to that. You know, I'd like to invite John to come up at this time. And we have some ushers that have some cards that they are ready to give out. We'll be showing you the information on that card in a little bit. But uh, it's basically an opportunity for you to respond to what you've heard tonight. I'd like to have John sing a verse in this uh, song as the ushers pass out these cards. And I'm going to invite you and you who are watching tonight to make a decision about what you've heard regarding the gospel. <laughs> 